This is K-Pop Sunday brought to you by the K-Pop Sundays before you have to go back to work on Monday. We are your hosts, Old R, Mim, and JR. Hello and welcome to episode 39, season 2 episode something. Episode 2 of The Seven Story. So last time we talked about Seven's rise in Korea and abroad. As this is going to be a continuation of that, we recommend you listen to the previous episode before continuing on to this one. Anyway, let's talk about Seven in 2010 and his comebacks in Korea. After three years and eight months, Seven was ready to promote in Korea again. On July 20th, there was a party for his comeback that 350 fans attended. 250 of those were Korean and 100 were Japanese. When talking about his US debut, Seven and YG both said that it was a shame that the promotions were cut short, but it was possible that he could return to the US in the future. The next day, on July 21st, his first mini album, Digital Bounce, dropped. The album's theme was digital, as you can imagine, and contained seven songs that fit the concept. On July 21st, the music video for the high-energy title track, Better Together, was released. Fans were very pleased with this comeback because it was him declaring that he was back and still an impressive performer. He had a very masculine appearance and even his tattoo on his left arm fit with the look perfectly when he was wearing sleeveless vests. Even though it was popular at the time to use autotune voices to sound digital, Better Together used it to highlight how good his normal voice is. On September 27th, Seven started promoting the track I'm Going Crazy. Even though this song is on the mini album, it was also released as a single. I'm Going Crazy is a sad song about a couple who can't stop fighting, and the music video shows time going backwards between flashbacks of Seven being a bad boyfriend because he's busy being an idol. Compared to the other times he's had co-stars in his music videos, for this one, the actress is none other than Seven's actual girlfriend, Park Hanbyul. Seven had recommended her for the role because he thought she was good at playing sad roles. Digital Bounce was another promoted track and it featured Big Bang's Top, who joined him for live performances of the song. Money Can't Buy Me Love was composed by Teddy and is in English because it was promoted in the US back when Girls was being released. This song was probably included because it fits perfectly with the digital sound of the album. The final track from this mini album, Drips, is kind of explicit and was his first song to have a 19 plus rating in Korea, meaning that you have to be at least 19 years old in order to listen to it. All in all, this mini album was a great way for Seven to return to the Korean music scene after being gone for so long. In 2011, Seven had a pretty chill year. Seven performed at the How You Dream Festival from October 1st to 3rd, along with many other K-pop acts. The point of this festival was to get foreigners to come to Korea and look at the best K-pop had to offer. So, it makes sense that Seven was there because a lot of these fans probably saw him in the US. Then on November 6th, Seven returned to Japan for his concert Hello Seven in Japan, where he greeted his fans. Oh lord, how he loves using his name in any title he can. Probably his company's choice. Most likely his company's choice. Two days later, on November 8th, he released his first Japanese digital single, Angel. And that's how he ended 2011. Seven kicked off 2012 by being a part of the YG family concerts in Japan, which were held on January 21st and 22nd. Then, a few days later, on February 1st, Seven released his second mini-album, Seven, new mini-album. This one contained six songs and was more like his past work as opposed to Digital Bounce. The title track for this mini-album was a ballad called When I Can't Sing. The lyrics for the song ask if the listener would still love him if he becomes unpopular or can't sing anymore. The music video for it opens with him finishing a performance and follows him as he's leaving the performance hall and going past his fans. He wanders through a small city that's full of references to his career until it fades to black and he's dancing under a single spotlight. And finally, it ends with him in the living room staring at a TV. It's a pretty melancholy video, except when GD appears to greet Seven and he's really smiley about it. This song was written by JYP and the two singers did get to perform it together for one performance. The song was received well and ranks number one on Korean music charts, on Korean and US iTunes R&B charts, and even got number one on Inkigayo. A few days later, on February 7th, he released 
Somebody Else. The song is about having a hard time moving on and wanting to keep memories of the relationship alive, even though the other person is moving on with somebody else. The music video supports this with Seven being haunted by memories of the past, and at the end he sees his ex again and regrets losing her. He was in a very sad mood for this year. Technically, JYP started it off. Yeah, that was it's the always thing. his fault. Well, the funny thing about Even If I Can't Sing was that it wasn't meant for Seven. <laughs> it was meant for JYP. Seven heard and he's like handed over. Like, I, I'm sure he said it nicer, but he pretty much I love that. kind of not really scammed or bullied, but basically put pressure on him to give it to him. And I was joking for a few other people. Imagine if Seven, like people have been complaining about JYP Entertainment's treatment of like Day Six and stuff. Imagine what would happen if Seven was just like, we're sending over Seven to deal with you. It's like, <laughs> JYP's biggest fear, Seven. Aside from the two main promoted tracks, the Korean version of his Japanese single Angel from the previous year was included on this mini album as well. March 25th was the final day Seven promoted this mini album because he was gearing up to do activities outside of Korea. To start his overseas promotions, Seven won the Best Overseas Performer Award at the China Music Award and Asian Influence Awards in Macau, and was the only Korean artist invited to the event. Then, on May 3rd, he held a showcase for his seventh Japanese single, Love Again. He also sang the Japanese version of Even If I Can't Sing, among other hit songs to the 5,000 fans who attended. However, it wasn't just fans who wanted to see him. 21 were in Japan at the time and decided to drop in without telling him ahead of time. It was a very cute YG family moment and a great way to kick off his Japanese promotions. Love Again managed to rank at number 6 on the Oricon chart on the day of its release. On September 5th, Seven released Seven The Best in both Japan and Korea. As the title implies, it was a compilation album of the best songs in his discography so far. It was released ahead of his 10th year debut anniversary, which would be coming in March of 2013. But that wasn't the only anniversary to celebrate, as on September 16th, he had his first concert in Tokyo in five years to a crowd of 5,000 fans. And this was great. This was a good time, but 2013 was coming around the corner and it would send Seven's fans on a interesting roller coaster of emotions. <laughs> so let's just get on with it, I guess. Ooh. Strap in. <laughs> That was the most emotionless strap in I've ever heard. <laughs> Giraffe in, guys. We're going for it. When I say it's a roller coaster, I'm not kidding. For his Japanese fans, he had his final concerts called 7 2013 Concert in Japan on February 7th and 8th in Tokyo and February 16th and 17th in Kobe. These are very, very original titles. He's He's really great at this. Yeah. In addition to the concerts, he released his final Japanese song, Arigato, or Thank You, on March 20th. This song was especially meaningful for Japanese fans, as Seven wrote the song himself. Before the song's official release, he did perform it during the final concerts. His fans decided to surprise him by holding up banners during the song that read Arigato 7. He was so touched by it that he burst into tears in front of his fans for the first time since debut. For his fans in Korea, the final concert was called Thank You for Them and was on March 9th. This concert was a talk concert as he wanted to not only perform his biggest hits, but also have time to communicate with his fans, as this was also a celebration of his 10th debut anniversary. He released 20 songs and just had fun hanging out with his fans, both Korean and overseas, and 21 who were there as well. Ten days later, on March 19th, Seven enlisted, and he promised his fans to come back. However, he had one last surprise up his sleeve. During the Thank You concert, he performed a song by the same name that he wrote to say goodbye to his fans. On the day that he enlisted, a music video for Thank You was released that showed him singing at the concert along with cuts from the past 10 years of being an idol, and it all ended with him smiling and walking away. It seemed like Seven was going to be out of the news for the next two years while he was in the military. At least, that's what we thought for the first few months of his enlistment. Seven was a public relations support personnel, a.k.a. entertainment soldier, <laughs> <That's so bad. laughs> to 
oversimplify, it was a 15-member military squad for entertainers, and he served with other celebrities like Rain, KCM, and Sang Chu from Mighty Mouth. On June 21st, a few months after Seven enlisted, his squad had a performance in honor of the Korean War, which had started on June 25th, 1950. After that performance, quite a few of the members of the squad decided to go out to a restaurant dressed in civilian clothes, have drinks, and use cell phones, which was prohibited at the time. At one point, Seven and Sang Chu decided to go to a massage parlor. If you've been into K-pop for a while, you're probably aware that idols tend to get massages after performances to prevent injuries. But in this case, their intent was questionable because the only one that they found that was open late didn't offer massages. The two were in there for only a few minutes, then came out when they were informed that, no, seriously, this place doesn't offer massages. But that wasn't where the matter ended. The public heard about it after a show on SBS reported on it. The unit had already been somewhat publicly known for violating military rules due to Rain previously being caught multiple times for going on dates with his now wife, Kim Taehee, when he wasn't supposed to. But this incident was the last straw. On July 18th, it was announced that after a 10-day audit had been conducted, the squad was to be disbanded. At this point, the squad was to promote the military and boost morale for the troops. But after multiple scandals, they ended up doing the opposite. The military had tried making stricter guidelines, but clearly that wasn't helping, so they decided to just get rid of it all. And then a week later, an official from the Ministry of National Defense announced that seven of the squad soldiers were facing disciplinary actions. Seven and Sang Chu were sent to a military prison for a few days on July 10th for going to the massage parlor, and the other five were also sent to prison for four days for bringing in cell phones. Even though an investigation had determined that Seven and Sang Chu really did go to the massage parlor to get massages and not solicit sex, they still went out when they weren't supposed to and caused a ruckus. Although they wouldn't technically have a criminal record for their time in a military prison, it definitely would not be forgotten by the public. Seven was officially discharged at the end of 2014 without any further incidents, and everyone was curious about what he would do next. Before enlisting, he had decided not to renew his contract with YG Entertainment that expired before he officially left for the military, so his next move was a mystery. On March 15th, it was announced that Seven was triple casted for the role of Death in the musical Elizabeth. The story is loosely based on the life of Empress Elizabeth of Austria and adds fantasy elements to it such as the personification of Death. The show ran from June 13th to September 6th, and the soundtrack for it, which Seven sings, The Shadows Are Getting Longer, was released on May 8th. It was a surprising move, as he hadn't done a musical before, but certainly an interesting move. But on a really cool note, the original author of the Elizabeth musical, Sylvester LeVay, listened to Seven's version of The Shadows Are Getting Longer, and he was impressed by it. And in the midst of his musical run, he also held his first fan meeting since being discharged. On July 7th, he met with his Japanese fans in Tokyo, and it was announced that he was starting a one-man agency called Eleven Nine, which was a reference to his birthday, November 9th. After Elizabeth ended, Seven went on tour in Japan, and to finish out the year, it was announced on December 23rd that Seven's new agency had officially opened its doors. Clearly, Seven was ready to get back to promoting, and fans were excited to see what was going to be happening. On January 8th, Seven's agency announced that he was working on a comeback. On May 10th, he was a special judge on the Super Idol audition show, which was the first time back to broadcasting since his enlistment. Then, on May 17th, he released the ballad song, Is It Okay?, for the OST of the drama Monster. Six months after his announcement for a comeback, he dropped the music video for I'm Good. This was his first official release since being discharged from the military and leaving YG Entertainment. It was a thank you to his fans who stood by his side during his scandal, and the track wasn't promoted on music shows. As a little aside, back in 2014, Seven and Park Han Byul announced that they had broken up after 12 years together. However, on September 7th, reports came out that Seven and actress Lee Dahe were dating. Both of the entertainer's agencies confirmed this and said that the two had been good friends before dating for a few months. 
On September 27th, Seven posted that he would be performing at the One Asia K-pop concert in Busan on October 2nd. Not only would he be performing his greatest hits, but he would also be performing the title track from his new mini-album before its official release later in October. The first teaser for this comeback, Give It To Me, was dropped on October 11th, and a few days later, on the 14th, Give It To Me and his new mini-album, I Am Seven, was released. This mini-album had seven tracks, and included the I'm Good single that was released a few months prior. Don't have a drinking game for how many times you say seven in this episode. You're gonna be dead. I know. You would die. Yeah. Alcohol poisoning for sure. Even if you were do water, you'd wash you wouldn't yourself be out. hydrated. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Give It To Me was a funky dance track with lyrics about trying to convince a girl to come back to him. It was composed by Seven, as well as the stereotypes, Com, and former Super Junior M member, Henry. The music video had graphics from the James Bond films and featured a lot of dancing. However, even though Seven was happy with the mini-album, the public didn't react positively to his comeback. Although the album wasn't of lower quality compared to his past releases, the public still acted cold to him due to the military scandal. While researching this episode, we found an article from 2017 that analyzed celebrity scandals. The analysis looked at 44 scandals, categorized them by type, and then looked at how long until these entertainers made a comeback. What they found was that when it came to military scandals, the public had no chill compared to sex scandals, illegal drug use, gambling, and even DUIs, the public reacts the harshest to military scandals. Even though this article came out a year after Seven started making a comeback, it's still something to keep in mind when we discuss how different his activities were in Korea versus other countries after this release. Although unpopular, he was still very talented and on October 22nd, airing of Immortal Song, he won three victories in a row during his first time on the show. After that schedule, Seven bounced and went to say hi to his Japanese fans. On December 7th, Seven's second Japanese album, Danger Man, was released. The album featured 12 tracks, including Rainbow, which had come out earlier in the year. The title song was also called Danger Man. <laughs> and the music video is basically Seven taking up the style of his role in the Elizabeth musical and transforming it into pop. This included choreography involving gloves with laser finger pointers and a return of Light and Dark Seven. He ended 2016 on a high note, with promotions overseas, but as of this recording, that would be his final year filled with as many music releases. 2017 started off quietly and would stay that way until spring. On March 16th, Seven's company announced that he would be playing Oliver in the Japanese play Maybe Happy Ending in May, where he would be playing a robot that resembles a human. Then, after being on hiatus for a few months, he returned with the 2017-7 Danger Man Tour, which went on for three days in Japan and he saw mm -hmm. over 10,000 fans during its run. On November 9th, he came back with a new Japanese album, 1109, which had 10 tracks and included the single Number 7. Seven started off 2018 on a surprising note. On January 27th, he participated in the K-Bop Night concert at the Wembley SSE Arena in London. This was the first time since his debut nearly 15 years prior that he had performed anywhere near Europe, so this was exciting for fans who lived there. Then, he returned to the stage in Korea for the musical Dogfight and played the character Bird Race during the show's run from June 1st to August 12th. A few days later, after the musical ended, he was in Jakarta, Indonesia. On August 15th, he participated in the torch relay for the Jakarta Palembang Asian Games. He ran for 500 meters and was the only Hallyu star present. On November 25th, he released the single Scared, which didn't have any promotions. The song is about being afraid to fall in love after being hurt before, and it's rather beautiful. There is a live video of him singing it while somebody plays the instrumental next to him, though. So you should go listen to it. It's very pretty. To finish the year, Seven held a concert in Japan on... December 24th. It had a lot of memorable moments, including Seven dressing up as Santa. Very cute. But the most wholesome moment is that his father came on stage and sang a duet with him. Seven started off 2019 by appearing on Video Star on January 9th and said that he was preparing to make a comeback. 
Sure enough, on February 12th, Seven dropped his new digital single, Cold. It was another song composed by Seven himself. But more importantly, it sounds like what you'd expect a soundtrack for winter snow and ice to sound like. After this single dropped, he was pretty quiet until August 23rd when he sang during the opening ceremony for the 7th Busan International Comedy Festival. This was the last schedule he had for the year because he was busy planning for 2020. What did he do in 2020? Well, he was one of the judges for the show Top Goal Rhapsody, which featured foreign contestants putting their own spin on Korean hit songs of the past. However, he didn't release any music in 2020. Aside from COVID, another reason why this could be was that it was announced on April 17th that he had joined a new agency, Demost Entertainment, which changed its name to Star It Entertainment, also known as Stay Entertainment, a month after he signed an exclusive contract with them. So what about the present? We are currently in 2021. So we can't talk about what happens for the rest of the 2020s. If you're listening to this, not in 2021. We don't know. Hasn't happened yet. <laughs> How's the future going? Anyway, in 2021, he released one song, Mona Lisa, on July 7th in both Korean and in English. But the catch... It's an NFT. If NFT suddenly stops being a thing in five years, you'll just have to look up some ancient documents describing them, because I honestly don't have the willpower to explain to you what NFTs are. But <laughs> they make a song not available for streaming or downloading. You have to specifically buy them, and if you share them, you don't. You just don't. Things will go very bad for you if you leak them. So a lot of like reference places don't list Mona Lisa as being part of its discography just because it isn't available to the general public. Like if you try searching for it on YouTube, you'll get clickbaity ads about the NFT, but it's not the song itself and you likely won't be able to listen to it, at least not in this year. Maybe sometime in the future it will just be dropped into the universe, but who knows? We are mere peasants that are not allowed to listen to the song. But at least we're not the only videos of him on YouTube in this year, as he started a YouTube channel about golfing on August 8th, as that is one of his favorite hobbies. So in addition to his YouTube golfing career, he's also been active on Instagram. Yeah, there's not a, a lot more happening right now. If something happened on October 17th, we won't know about it, because that hasn't happened yet. Yes, we pre record these in back time. I will say, though, we look at a lot of YouTube channels for K-pop artists. His is one of the most organized and easy to navigate that we've seen. It has been, I think, the only one that's better than his that I've seen so far is Jackie's. Jackie's is so nice, so organized, and also Seven's Instagram, so nice and organized. You can see his concert events, music, flashbacks to the past, him hanging out. It's so organized and so well done. Like, it is a model for how idols should do their Instagram. You heard it here first, folks. Yes. Use Seven as your template. Yeah, if you're going to do social media, Seven's is organized. Because we have to go back through, like, a lot of stuff in order to find, you know, mm -hmm. just like, oh, here's, like, where he says blank and stuff like that. And... He makes it so easy. So I'm very grateful to who, if it is him or somebody else who runs the social media. Thank you. It made my days researching so much easier. To wrap up, Seven's return to Korea in 2010 was a success, but his military scandal undid a lot of goodwill he had built up over the years. His music and his skills haven't declined, but a lot of people still think of the scandal when his name is mentioned. However, as you've seen during this episode, he has branched out into musicals, pursued his passion for golf, and appeared at overseas events that he might not have done otherwise. He certainly has had a very interesting career, and we hope to hear more music from him in the future. Now, let's move on to the song of the day. On October 24th, 2013, The Light released their second mini-album, School Bells Ringing, with the single, A School Bells Ringing. The Light was a relatively short-lived girl group who I believe only released three singles during their time as an active group. And what I really like about these small groups from practically unknown entertainment companies 
is that basically when they're creating a song, they take everything that is popular at the current moment and mashes it into a song. So this song might not be the most memorable thing that has ever come out or that did come out in 2013, but it sounds like 2013. Yeah, it just is K-pop in 2013 is what this song is. From the styling to the dancing to just how the song feels, it's incredibly 2013 and it's it's wonderful. You should go listen to it and there is actually official music videos for the song and there are other songs I do believe too. And it's just fun. Go listen to it. Have some fun. Shall we trivia? Last time I had the trivia question. Seven debuted in YG Entertainment, but do you know the name of the first girl group in YG Entertainment? And the answer is Sweetie. Oh, Sweetie was Sweetie, a trio. Of course. Yes. Sweetie was a trio. They debuted in 2002 and disbanded in 2004. Even though they only had one album, but they did appear on one of the YG family albums. Family compilation albums. Yeah. They, mm-hmm. I think it was the second one they appeared on. Because, yeah, it must be because that's the only time they've ever had a digital release for, like, international audiences, to my knowledge. In researching for this trivia question, I found out that YG Entertainment had a group before Jinushan. So, YG, the first group that YG debuted was in 1996 before Jinushan, which was shocking to me, called Keep Six. But they didn't do well either. I totally forgot about them because I always just think of Jin Yushan because I like Jin Yushan. I'm very biased. Sorry. But <laughs> Sweet Tea was their first girl group, though, and they were also very short-lived. A lot of people think that 21 is YG's first girl group, but no, it was Sweet Tea. They came first. They were wonderful. But unfortunately, they didn't last long for reasons that we all know. That we could get sued for, so we're not going to talk about them now. <laughs> Technically, he's been very open about it, and he there's been like a lot of interviews with him where he's admitted to it. But anyway, I kind of cool gross. thing though, when I first of all of all the members, anyway, <laughs> when I was in Korea and like looking for old albums, I found this album, the Sweetie oh. album, and I was like, <gasps> I never thought I'd find a physical copy. I have not opened it yet because wow. because of the cockroaches, but I need to open it one day and go through it because there's a lot of tracks for it. There's like. 12 there's 12 songs and one of them is a remake of hotel california Ooh, so, interesting yeah some of these song titles i'm wondering if they've been redone and people just either forgot or like they were like it was YG like not recycled credited. them yeah like like they're, they're the title song is i'll be there which when i first heard it it really reminded me of taeyong's i'll be there but I'm not sure. I don't think that it is the same song, but I'm wondering though if some of these have been sort of recycled or hand me down to another group and we've all forgotten because we just didn't know enough about Sweet Tea. That would be interesting to see. Yeah. So YG Family was such a big deal for like a lot of artists back then where like everyone was appearing in everyone's stuff. So Sweet Tea's legacy, in addition to, you know, like all the YG Family stuff, it's pretty important and it has that little connection to Seven because like he was performing around the same time they were like before he debuted. Yeah, so that's the connection. Also, one last note before we peace out. I did put a lot of extra information in the document that did not make it on the last two episodes because there's a lot of information on him on Dom. <laughs> you won't find a lot of this information on English sites, but there's a lot of fascinating stuff he's gotten into. So I highly recommend you look at both the documents just for the extras alone, such as there's a mention of YG staff got into line to get an autograph for seven at one point because he just showed up at their office and they just stopped him. And instead of like anybody scolding the staff for not working, everyone was just like, "Ah, this is funny. Let's post it online. So just like (laughs) there's funny stuff like that. Seven got himself into weird stuff. He's one of them. He's very fascinating. So yes, please check out Seven and his music. He's he's really good quality music all the time, even when switching companies. So let's go. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the episode, then please make sure to rate, subscribe, follow, and tell your friends about us. If you want to interact with us or just see more of our content, then you can follow us on Twitter at Kpop Sunbays 
or on our other social media platforms, which will be linked in the description. Also, don't forget that our next episodes come out in November. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Annyeong. Watch out for the spooky.